Hello and welcome to the Nicola Wealth Real Estate Webinar, Mid-Year Update and Opportunities Ahead. My name is Ethan Astonay and I'll be your host for today. As mentioned in the introduction, you can submit questions at any time and we'll address as many of these as we can in the question and answer period. Also, as mentioned, today's webinar will be recorded and available to you for replay. Without delay, I would like to introduce our presenter, Mark Hanna. Mark is the Director of Real Estate at Nicola Wealth, and under his leadership, our real estate team, which formed in 2003, manages our in-house and private three real estate pools, which Mark will be giving us an update with respect to performance and strategy. Mark, it looks like you're joining us from the office today. Thanks again for your participation. Thanks, Ethan. Happy to be here. And I guess this is our third webinar. So looking forward to it. All right. Well, we're going to jump right into it. With the Q2 reports and results having been recently distributed, can you comment on performance so far and give us a sense of forward-looking projections? Sure, certainly. Um, so let me summarize our three uh, Nicole Wealth real estate funds. Um, and uh, these um, numbers are going to be as of June 30th, which is uh, the second quarter for this year. And, and these results and reports were just recently distributed to our clients. So let me start first with the Canadian Income Fund. Um, that recorded 10.92% um, year to date, um, and it continues to crush it and uh, lead the pack. I think the reason for the strong performance really relates to our fund composition for, and primarily to um, multifamily apartments, uh, self-storage, and of course, industrial. Uh, we're benefiting from uh, some significant income growth, both on renewals and new leases that our team is doing, but we're also benefiting from the cap rate compression uh, that is uh, occurring due to the strong performance of these certain asset classes. Uh, moving on to the US income fund, um, the return year to date is 3.97, so rounded up to four. That's year to date. Um, the, the valuation increases for our, our Ventera multifamily uh, residential assets, uh, they're now starting to kick in. So I think you're going to see a lot of strong growth uh, in the returns for the second half of the year. We're already seeing that now. And to complement that strategy, um, we've been acquiring um, a lot more industrial product in certain markets like Phoenix, Denver, Las Vegas, Seattle, and soon to be Minneapolis. And there's other markets also on our radar screen that we're considering, such as uh, Dallas and Austin. And so we expect this strategy to pay off uh, soon, very soon, similar to what we've experienced with, say, our Toronto and Vancouver uh, positions, which has contributed to the tremendous growth in our Canadian income fund. And then the last fund is our, the third fund is our value add fund. And that return year to date is 5.6%. Um, there's some significant sales that um, are going to occur, uh, such as, say, Birchmount uh, in Toronto, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. And those um, sales will be recognized on closing in the coming months, and that's going to result in a, a, a jump in the returns. So um, I'm very confident that of the where we're going to end up at the end of the year for the value add fund. We expect to be adding uh, close to 40 new projects this year to our value add fund. That's a, that's a high volume. And we're very excited about these projects with our partners and they all look very promising. So we expect to have a double digit return by year end. So if we can just put up, pull up on the screen here, um, the, the returns. Um, so we've, I've just mentioned what they are as of year to date for the Canadian fund and we're, projecting very conservatively that it's going to end up at 12 to 14. I think it's actually going to, in my opinion, it's going to far surpass the 14, but this, these are conservative numbers. Uh, for the U.S. fund, we're at four, I, and it's always traditionally been in that 10, 11% range. I expect we're going to be conservatively in that eight to nine and a half percent range by year end. And then lastly, for our value add fund, um, as I said, we're at 5.6. Um, I, I feel very comfortable with the projects that are completing, plus the new ones we're adding. We're going to end up easily in that 10 to 12% range. Well, thanks for that, Mark. It's uh, great to hear that positive outlook. Uh, going to acquisitions, sounds like we've been pretty busy. Can you walk us through our current strategy, uh, You know, maybe 
with some comments about asset types and market dynamics. And can you also touch on how COVID might have impacted that strategy? Sure. So I've said this in our past uh, two uh, webinars that fund composition is really important. And that was uh, really came to light uh, during COVID. Um, rent collection exposed real estate like never before on a global basis. Um, so we look at a couple of things. One is the liquidity of the asset that has a big uh, impact on property valuations. So not that we're selling, but it has an impact on the growth of that of the value. The second is the leasability of the assets. It's critical to maintaining both high occupancy and rent collection and getting that rental growth. So the clear winners um, over the past year and a half have been multi, it's, a lot of people have, you know, this is no secret, but the multifamily rental apartments, the industrial assets and the self storage and the flex slash kind of creative office product. Those assets um, command a premium and this is exactly why we're now also building these assets under our build to own program, which I'll talk about in a bit, uh, and which will be accretive to the returns of our funds. The not so lucky assets uh, were hotels and certain um, retail, such as say enclosed malls. Um, it's amazing. Some retail actually did weather the storm, such as say neighborhood shopping centers, food anchored um, or power centers. For high rise office space, I think the jury's still out. Uh, the return to work is unfolding right now for most companies that are planning to come back in, in the fall, but no doubt hybrid working will, and environments will impact the office space needs. So in some cases, uh, tenants will need more space to spread out. In other cases, um, uh, companies may choose to adopt more work from home. So I think it's it's too early to, to, uh, um, to, to for high rise office space. Um, geography is also a very important consideration. We've been strategic in selecting certain markets that either feature a low vacancy rate or say strong employment growth um, or favorable tax environment. Um, going forward, we're gonna continue to focus on assets that have performed well and, and that has benefited our funds such as the multifamily apartments and industrial and the flex office and self storage. However, we do think there will be opportunities for stressed assets such as retail. And we're gonna to continue to look to uncover those. Um, also another strategy that we've adopted over the past couple of years is we're, we're acquiring what we call covered land plays. This is in both in Canada and the US and a covered land play is where we can buy a property that's got an, an existing cash flow on the property. Perhaps it's older, um, it's got an attractive holding income for say the short to medium term, but we know that there's a higher calling for that property um, and there's a next generation. So typically these would include transit oriented sites and that's helped us um, very quickly build up a, a large inventory of future development sites while benefiting from strong holding income until we plan for that next evolution of the property. So we're gonna pull up a, a, a couple slides here on to illustrate this. So going sort of clockwise from the top, um, these are some examples of, of acquisitions. That we, um, this is in Oakville. So this is a sale lease back for the area in blue. The area in red is a surplus land of 17 acres. So we're gonna develop that out now, but the area in blue, we have a lease back for 10 years. And once that lease expires, then we'll finish building out the park. And this is gonna be your traditional um, mid to large bay industrial product distribution space. Um, Royal Windsor Ave, uh, Drive, it's the same actual um, sale leaseback, same company, and the same concept. We've got a 10-year leaseback, and so once that's done, we'll, we, we'll start planning now for what that's going to look like for industrial distribution space. And on the corner in yellow of that one, in the one in the middle, is um, we, we have uh, some surplus where we can build a new self-storage facility, our first one, in the Toronto market. Then on the, on the top right, we have on uh, Milner Avenue, we bought uh, 20 acres of prime industrial land on the 401. And we are now in the planning stages and hope to start production very soon to build uh, 350,000 feet of uh, traditional distribution space. Uh, going down in the bottom right, we have Queensboro Mini Storage. This is a great complement to our existing 
um, self storage portfolio. So we close on that early next year. Plus it has the ability to add more self storage space on that property with the surplus land. Going into the middle, um, Bay Bridge complex in Victoria. This is a, a, a prime located um, a multi tenant industrial property that has multiple strategies in the future, including self storage in a very um, strong market in Victoria. And then the last one on the bottom left is 680 Raymer. This is a, uh, a property that is in the uh, Venables area uh, near the St. Paul's Hospital. It's a, an existing industrial building. We can repurpose this and um, we've got a short term lease back from the owner. But once they leave, um, we'll be uh, upgrading this property and, and we'll get a significant bump in, in the rate. Mark, we've got some some U.S. properties on on the screen here. Did you were you planning on speaking to those as yeah, well? Yeah. So I'll keep going here. So um, on the um, starting again on the on the top left, um, here's an example of um, this is in um, uh, South Seattle and uh, in Soto Overmarks, and this is a a great covered land play for now with great. Um, many, many tenants in here that are in the wine and the, and the beer industry. And, and um, so this has got holding income. We like this Soto market south of downtown Seattle, which is just south of the, for the people that know Seattle, where the uh, Seahawks and the Mariners play. So that whole area, we've been acquiring a number of properties in that area that are um, going to have great upside potential down the road. Then in the middle, we got Parmac um, 200 building. It's an industrial building in uh, Kirkland, just the north of Seattle, uh, multi-tenant building, um, and then on the on the uh, far top uh, right, we've got Hacienda. This is in Las Vegas. This is a nice um, multi-family, uh, sorry, not multi, a multi-tenanted industrial park, uh, which is a great complement to our growing industrial portfolio in that market. And then going down to the to the bottom right, we've got. Um, 143 Business Park. Again, this is a multi-building, multi-tenant uh, industrial uh, pro um, uh, portfolio that we just acquired. Um, great opportunity for us to turn the rents and, um, and keep the occupancy at a high level. In the middle is uh, uh, in Tempe, near the, near the campus, near ASU. It's a nice uh, creative office building with some retail grade and then uh, three floors of, of office space. And then uh, on the bottom left, we've got... Uh, Hampton. This is also in Phoenix. This is a, um, a property with a single tenant to Tesla for their service center. And um, we have a long term, a 10 year lease with them. Should they elect not to stay at the end of 10 years, we've got a large land parcel here to redevelop into traditional industrial space. And then the last one in the value add um, category, again, starting in the top left. Um, I've been very active in the Toronto market, as you can see. And in fact, five of the six are from Toronto. So um, we've got, starting on the top left, we've got Leaside Industrial. There's multiple strategies. This is with our partner, Northbridge. Um, there's a building, existing building we can repurpose. And then there's some land to the left that we can redevelop. In the middle is an industrial portfolio that we acquired with First Gulf. This is a nine property uh, portfolio. The, the strategy was to buy this in bulk and sell the pieces. Um, of the nine properties, we've already sold six way ahead of schedule. We've got a seventh one that's under negotiation. And then the final two will be converted to small bay industrial strata. And then going to the top right, uh, Wind Green Apartments. Um, this is with Northbridge. Um, this is a, a, a portfolio of uh, four or five apartment buildings in really good condition. And our strategy is to go in and uh, upgrade the suites, which haven't been done a long time, and increase the rents over time. Going down to the bottom right, we've got 1605 Gordon. This is in Kelowna. We've had great success building multifamily rental apartment buildings and then, and then selling um, uh, on completion. So we just close on this and we'll be starting construction in uh, early next year. In the middle um, on the bottom, we've got Highway 27. This is gonna be one of our first small bay industrial strata condo projects, which we have had a lot of success with in Vancouver, Victoria and Kelowna. So this will be our First one in the in the Toronto markets. So we're very excited. That's with uh, Northbridge, and then um, and then the bottom left 
um, Allendale Road in Cambridge. This is a, a joint venture with First Golf and Challenger, who is the current landowner. The plan there is to build four uh, traditional distribution uh, industrial buildings and then some upon completion. You weren't kidding. Very busy on, on acquisitions and really helpful to see the specific types of properties in each of the pools. Thank you for that, Mark. It, it makes me think a little bit about cash flow management. Um, and uh, can you speak a little bit about that and, and perhaps the degree to which capital continues to come into the funds? Yeah, so managing our cash flow is obviously very critically important. Um, due to the strong rent collection of 98% for our portfolio during COVID, which I've mentioned in our past webinars, this, this has allowed our team to have really good visibility on our cash flow and know much we have to work with. Our funds have a six month redemption notice. So our, th these funds are not treated like a, a term deposit. Um, many other North American and global funds were not so lucky. They have immediate liquidity. So uh, with a short redemption notice period, that required them once again to shut down their funds, just like 2008. So we're fortunate that our Nicola Wealth clients, they have a, lo a very long term investment horizon and they're very patient and they've been very loyal. Um, there's no doubt that 2020 was a very stressful time for everyone, and, um, but, but our, our company performed well uh, through COVID uh, with the performance of our funds. So not only were we rewarded with loyalty uh, by our existing clients, but we also attracted a lot more new capital to the firm. So what this has done is it's enabled us to, our Nicola Wealth real estate team, to acquire more real estate and we are on track to do a record volume of acquisitions that it's going to be somewhere between one and a half billion to 2 billion in acquisitions just this year. And that's more than double what we did in our previous high, um, uh, high watermark. So I, I think this is a valid a validation um, um, on what the performance of our team and our funds, but we know uh, Ethan that the pressure is always going to be on us to keep performing to producing good outcomes to keep our clients happy. And this is why um, our strategy will continue to be, let's just look for singles and doubles and try to turn them into triples and home runs. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Mark. It makes me think a little bit about, you know, with these funds now exceeding $5 billion in gross assets, can you talk about the importance of having the right team structure and composition to manage a quickly growing and large portfolio. Yes, uh, having a, a, a talented team is, is critical. So with our three um, Nicole Wealth real estate funds, that we've experienced a tremendous growth over the past few years as we've now surpassed 5 billion Canadian in gross asset value. So real estate doesn't run on its own. The absolute key to our success is our people on our team and they deserve all the credit. Um, they have worked incredibly hard over the past year and a half during COVID working in the office. Um, if, we, if we had to work from home, we, we, I guess we could have, but it made it a lot easier working in the office where we can collaborate and it's a very collegial atmosphere. So our team is growing fast. We've got 44 team members and growing. Um, they're very experienced and they're highly dedicated at getting the right outcomes for our clients. Uh, we've implemented systems and processes that I think will enable our team to easily scale up to the next high water mark or, or goal of 10 billion gross asset value and beyond. We've made some very strategic additions to our team over the past couple of years, including in-house mortgage specialists for our very large portfolio, leasing specialists to keep our portfolio leased and grow that revenue, um, uh, development team to to you know, implement our build to own strategy and then specialized asset managers for, cert, for, for whether it's advanced for our self storage portfolio or multifamily. And of course, an insurance specialist where that's another topic we'll talk about later where th those costs are rising. So you can, that's just an example of, of, of how we've built out our team. Um, another important fact that I'll, I'll finish with on this question is, um, for our clients and our potential clients, um, they should know that um, Nicola Wealth employees 
are heavily invested in, in the real estate funds. And we, uh, the last count I got was we have over hundred million dollars invested just in the real estate funds and the three real estate funds. So I, I think that's good alignment with our clients to help get the right outcomes. Thanks, Mark. Helpful to hear that from a scale perspective, we've got the right infrastructure and we also on the team eat our own cooking. Um, you mentioned insurance premiums, and since it's such a hot topic, maybe we can go there next. So they seem to be rising fast. And from what I hear in the media across all asset classes, can you talk about how that's impacting our funds? Yeah, I think probably the most, uh, what we've seen in the headlines is really about condo insurance for towers, but it's actually affecting all asset types. So historically, I think real estate owners took insurance for granted. You buy the property, you put insurance on it at closing, and it was you know, you could, it's pretty reliable. So um, now you can just throw that out the window because that's all changed. So in, in most instances, the insurance costs are typically a pass-through to your tenants. However, there are certain asset types in our portfolio that you don't pass that through to. And that's what the examples would be rental apartment buildings, self-storage or seniors living, which is in our portfolio. And that cost is not passed through because it's absorbed by us because it's part of your gross rent. So you've got to make sure you're efficient. So the challenge we're facing is that certain asset classes are experiencing a huge increase in the risk premium. And specifically, uh, certain assets such as uh, rental apartment buildings or say older properties are getting impacted. There's no doubt, and we'll talk about this in a bit, Ethan, um, climate change is having a big impact on rising insurance costs, and it's only gonna get worse going forward. So, um, we don't see this environment changing anytime soon, but what our team will continue to do is to secure the most affordable insurance for both our tenants and ourselves without compromising the appropriate coverage for our assets and our portfolio. Thanks, Mark. Hearing you walk us through that is reassuring. Maybe we can switch gears a little bit and talk about our income funds. Can you explain in the income funds, do we ever sell a property? And if so, why might we do that if the intention of those funds is actually to hold properties and collect that rental income? Yeah, I know that um, it's not, we, we typically don't want to sell properties, but our, uh, if you look at our three funds, they're evergreen open-ended funds, and they were designed to keep assets long-term. That's what those funds do. The value add fund is different because that's designed to build and sell and repurpose and sell. So if we look at just the income funds, um, you know, growing the revenue, then refinancing it every five years, which is a typical term, and then recapitalizing the asset. Um, it's a simple but proven strategy for real estate investing. So while we have a clear investment strategy in terms of, you know, the geographic markets and the asset types, strategies and criteria, they change over time. And we constantly review that and discuss that with our team. So we do a a full review of our entire portfolio on a semi-annual basis. We just finished our, that review um, 30 days ago. And with over 220 properties in our portfolio and growing, you can imagine that is a, that's a big undertaking, but it's necessary. So in that review, we identify properties that might be suitable for disposition for various reasons, including we don't invest in that market anymore, or it's the it's the size of that asset's too small, or maybe that asset type we're just not, that's not part of our criteria going forward. So while we generally don't sell that often, we do believe it is a, it's a good discipline to call the portfolio from time to time. And I've got a couple examples that we'll put on the screen here just to um, show what we've, what we've done this year. So um, there's three that we've done. And again, we don't do that many and we probably do, would do max two or three per year. But uh, going from left to right, we've got um, low heat super center in Coquitlam. We had this asset, it performed very well. We had to replace a couple of tenants along the way, but um, we wouldn't necessarily pursue this asset today. It's a power center retail. And um, we received an unsolicited offer at a price higher than our NAV. So we said, you know, let's, let's look at if we can do it at that price. It's accretive to the return of the fund. So we, we executed on that in Q1. In the middle, um, this is a, an office building in Prince George uh, in a market where we probably aren't gonna acquire more assets. 
what attracted us originally in buying this is we got a 15 year lease back from the BC government. They're the sole occupant. So during COVID, it was great because we know we're going to get the rent, but we thought going forward, this is not a market we're probably going to uh, aggregate. Um, so we thought with nine to 10 years left, this would be a good time to offer the next buyer some term with a great covenant uh, because we knew we were going to acquire more in that marketplace. So this just closed um, this week, actually. Um, so that is sold. And then in the U.S. fund, um, the last one here on the right, Canyon Park Heights, this is predominantly occupied by one major tenant, uh, healthcare, and that uh, it's in a very strong uh, market north of Seattle. And even though it's in a very um, active market and healthcare is a very strong um, asset type right now, um, this particular tenant would only renew for a maximum of three years. So we didn't like that exposure. So again, we received an off market um, unsolicited offer that was higher than our NAV and we decided to transact and that closed in uh, Q1 as well of this year. It's great to see those examples. Thanks for that, uh, Mark. I'm gonna try to keep you on your toes here and, and shift gears um, again. So as we embark on this economic recovery from COVID, you know, inflation is rising and so is the threat of, of interest rate increases or the expectation of. Are you worried about these and how does this impact our funds? Well, firstly, I think our team worries every day about a lot of things um, and it keeps us Good. on our toes. Um, so, but there's no doubt that I think uh, we've been very spoiled um, over the last couple of years with a low interest rate environment. And however, I think it's possible it could continue for a while. Um, in the short term, I don't see any major fluctuations in the interest rates. Um, I'm not an economist, but you know, just looking at history, the US and Canadian governments and their Federal Reserve, they typically work in, in lockstep. Um, I'm sure they're gonna look for an opportunity to raise interest rates in the future when the economy strengthens so that they have room down the road to further reduce rates when they need to stimulate the economy again. Um, so there, it will happen. It just, it's, we just don't know when. When interest rates do rise, um, that will have an impact on cap rates. Because again, interest rates and cap rates, they work on lockstep too. There's usually a spread and they follow suit. And when cap rates go up, that has a negative impact on property values. So why is this important um, for our team? It's, it's it, it, the, the, I've talked about the leasing a few minutes ago about how critical it is to grow revenue and get annual rental increases. And by doing that, that helps counterbalance this future event of rising cap rates. Um, the other concern that our team has with inflation really relates to, it relates to rental rates, um, labor costs, uh, materials, uh, land prices. It's concerning and I think it's going up at a pace I've never seen before. So will it keep going? It's, it's hard to say, but it's been, it's been uh, truly amazing over the last nine months. So it's rising at an alarming rate. Um, don't see it stopping. But as you can see there, uh, Ethan, there's a lot of moving parts for our, that our real estate team has to navigate. Sounds like it. And, and one of those moving parts, uh, you know, you touched on a little bit, it has to do with our leasing strategy. Can you comment a little bit about why leasing strategy is important? Sure. So we've all heard the phrase that cash flow is king. So <laughs> leasing is pretty important. Um, it's not just to keep the assets leased, but it's also to get the right tenant profile, the right covenant, proper, properly structured leases that have that built-in rental growth I just alluded to. And that helps counterbalance these rising cap rates and inter interest rates at some point in the future. Um, we've made a strategic move to hire two very highly skilled experienced leasing specialists and they've made a material difference to the outcomes of our assets. Um, tenant retention is really important and it's critical to our fund return so we want to treat our tenants are our partners we got to keep them happy they know the building better than we do they're, they're the ones that are there every day so we, we treat them like our partner and also um, working with the real estate brokerage community is really important we want to treat them with respect we want to pay them fairly so that they also treat us well and help us on tenant retention. Um, we don't like vacancy, but we're not afraid of it because we're confident that if we acquire the assets, you know, in the right geographic nodes, 
they should appeal to a wide range of users and that will always command strong interest from tenants. Thanks for that, Mark. You you talked about a concerted effort or, or gave examples of build to own properties for our income funds. Why is this important given the market dynamics? And also with the recent uh, construction crane incident in Kelowna, what type of impact might this have on the construction industry? Okay, so I'll do the first question, part of the question. So um, we would love to buy new and shiny, but in order to do that, you you have to buy at full retail pricing and that just doesn't work for the returns in our fund. So this was a, re a, a really strategic move we made about three or four years ago that we want these new assets. So we figure if we build to own um, for income funds, we're gonna get better outcomes. So it's difficult to acquire that product at retail pricing and make those returns work in the fund. It just, the, the yields are too low. Um, so our build to own program allows our, our Nicola Wealth real estate team to create the value by buying the land and building the asset and finding the tenants, we're benefiting from the value. And we're building and we're choosing safe assets in the right location. So you, you just can't replicate those returns if you buy at retail pricing. So that's why we're doing it. So that, to give you an example, the type of safe assets that we're building include rental, uh, multifamily rental apartment buildings. I mean, they're the safest asset class. People have to live somewhere. And if you build in the right location, you're gonna have a rented up. Uh, and we've been doing that in Vancouver, Victoria, and, and soon other markets. Self-storage, we've had self-storage since day one. We love self-storage and we just beefed up that team recently, um, the management team. And so we're now up to eight and we're growing that fast. So where we see our, uh, all the assets currently are in the lower mainland, but we see ourselves expanding to Vancouver Island. We're now expanding in Ontario. We're building there and buying and we're also uh, and that's under the advanced self-storage brand. And we're also now just making a recent move into the U.S., um, ex expanding with um, new uh, build-to-own self-storage. So we're very excited about that, that asset class. Um, industrial distribution buildings, they're, 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 <laughs> they've obviously, um, they're, the, they're the popular one right now, and we've been building them in B.C. and Ontario and the southwest U.S. Um, office. We're not in the high rise tower business, but we don't mind, you know, single story office or creative office buildings. We've, we've, with the help of our partner, PC Urban, we built two uh, fantastic buildings in Mount Pleasant that are creative office buildings and, and they'll hold their value for long term. So we like that kind of that kind of product. So, so um, you know, with that strategy, we've now accumulated, a, a, um, um, I just go back to the land play. So, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been acquiring um, these, what I call these covered land play sites that have um, maybe older properties um, that, you know, have some holding income for the short to medium term, but we know that there's a, a better strategy for that property. So with that strategy, now we've, we've got this large land inventory for our development pipeline, um, but with the added benefit of this strong holding income, uh, while well, we plan for the next generation of that property. So um, we're, we're excited about that. Just to answer your second question, um, on the Kelowna um, crane incident, that was obviously tragic and it was very unfortunate. Um, five workers were killed. Um, it was near our site. Uh, it, it didn't impact our project there, uh, Block and Bertram. It, it affected uh, uh, a project um, nearby. Um, so. Unfortunately, this is going to result in some, well, fortunately, it's going to result in probably increased safety precautions, and but it's also going to have an impact on higher insurance premiums. So our thoughts are with those families that are impacted, and hopefully that doesn't happen again. So maybe we can just review a couple of these uh, build known projects that we're doing, Ethan, that um, we can share with our, our viewers. So going from, um, this is in our, our Canadian Income Fund. So going from the top left. Uh, this is the Spencer block. It's in Victoria, downtown Victoria. This is a rental apartment project. I think it's like 260 units. It's now underway. And um, we're very excited about this. This is in a very good location in down, downtown Victoria. In the middle is Mackenzie and Shelburne. Again, this has got great holding income uh, with an older retail mall and some office space. 
but we're now in the planning process where we're going to add somewhere between four to 500 rental apartment units. And this is like a few blocks from the University of Victoria. So we're very excited about getting this project into production. Uh, on the far right is the block um, in the top. And that's with our, our partner, the Mission Group. And so in behind it is a condo tower, which is all which just starting construction. And that's pretty much all pre-sold. That's in the value add fund. But the block is an office building with four levels of parking and retail at grade. And uh, we've already got tremendous interest for this, this property in, in the uh, Kelowna market. And it's right downtown Kelowna. And the exciting part about this is what's really generating a lot of interest and activity is the, is the recent announcement of the UBCO Okanagan to move uh, their downtown campus. And that's gonna really um, uh, help the, the, the downtown area of Kelowna uh, gentrify. In the bottom uh, right is 880 Avonhead Road. We built this with the help of First Gulf. Um, this just completed and we, it's a 300,000 foot building and we just leased this for a long-term lease to Amazon. So this is our first deal with Amazon. We've got another one we're doing in uh, Winnipeg, but we're very excited about this project and um, they're a great tenant to have, which helps you get great financing terms. And then in the middle, Spears Road, um, this is the project we talked about uh, earlier where we've um, in the white are two buildings we can build now on 17 acres. And then the building in the yellow, once that lease is up in 10 years, we can then scrape that building and carry on with the traditional industrial space. And then lastly, uh, Milner on the far uh, bottom uh, left, we did touch on this one earlier. This is in Toronto, right on the 401. We are now in the process of starting this uh, project for 350,000 feet of, an, of uh, new distribution space. It's, it's really helpful to see those examples, uh, Mark. Thank you. Uh, switching to the value add fund, which you mentioned a moment ago, it's now six years old and it has over 55 properties. Is the strategy in that fund changing or evolving? And can you talk about the asset types and maybe the market dynamics? Sure, um, the value add fund is now in, in its sixth year and it's really developed a solid track record. This is a pure merchant fund where we either build to sell or repurpose and sell. Um, so while the equity multiple for us is an important and interesting metric, the, the primary metric we're focused on is the IRR which is time weighted. So therefore, time is your enemy. So if a project takes longer to complete, that impacts negatively. The IRR, if it finishes earlier or had a budget, that's a positive outcome. The value add fund uh, benefited in the earlier years um, from some great tailwinds. And then around 2018, 2019, what we started to see is costs started to rise. Uh, permits took a lot longer, putting stress on the delivery date. Um, so we obviously you make adjustments as you go along to your underwriting to allow for those uh, conditions. So it's we find that it's challenging to, to acquire lands that might take two or three years to put into production due to the permit process. So the permit process is really the unknown for us. So it, it doesn't mean that you can't make a project work if it takes two to three years, but it definitely stresses the return. So we try to find sites that are that are closer to being into production, getting a shovel in the ground. So our strategy over time has adjusted slightly where we're, we're focusing on developments such as um, small bay industrial condo, which we've done 15 of those. We love those, those are great. That's, and a lot of them are under the interurban brand with Peace Urban. Um, building industrial for lease, small to, med to mid bay, that has also been successful for us. Multifamily rental apartment buildings, we've, had, we've completed now three and we're working on a few more. So the, there's a strong buyer pool for that product from private buyers or institutional groups that they don't have, they don't have an in-house development team. And um, buying, say, a portfolio in bulk, like the example I gave in, in Toronto for Hamilton and Burlington, where we can buy the bulk and sell the pieces. And then another strategy is the land and density entitlement play, which we're doing in, in Ontario. Um, one example that... Um, we, we like to use is this interurban product. Um, and one is in say Brentwood in Burnaby where it pre-sold hundred percent in before we even started construction. So that is now all sold out. So what we've learned is that in selecting the right partners, it's really important to have that alignment. And we've been really fortunate even to have um, 
some some terrific uh, relationships with, and I'm going to name a few. Hopefully, I don't miss any and get in trouble here. But like uh, PC Urban, First Golf, Northbridge, um, Grosvenor, Omicron, Lotus Pacific, PCI, uh, Density, Port, the Mission Group, Pure, uh, and Townline. So those are all been great partners, and we have others. Um, apologize if I missed any out. I may have. And then we also have two other partners that we joint venture with on projects, and that's Kingswood Capital and Northland Properties. They've also been great equity partners on some of these projects with us. So I think we're going to look at a couple of samples here on the screen. So um, in our value add fund, starting in the um, top left, this is Birchmount. We bought this industrial portfolio with Northbridge. We thought it was going to take three years. So we bought this for 45 million and the industrial market took off far quicker than we thought. So we advanced our timeline where we sold, ended up selling it a year and a half in. So uh, for 77 million. So that's a very good outcome. So that closed uh, this month. So we're very happy with that. So you know, if we see opportunities to move up the timeline or um, save money on our project, we will absolutely do that with our partner. The one in the middle uh, at the top is West Cologne Industrial Park. Uh, this is with Density, great partner. Um, we had a four or five phases in this this industrial park and and uh, this sold out very quickly and ahead of schedule. So we're very happy with the outcome there. The far top at uh, the top right is a sample of our uh, interurban product with PC Urban, which is a very popular product. And um, this one is a gateway. Um, this is now just starting construction, but we've already sold it out 100% in advance of putting a shovel ground, which is just is a validation to the quality of the product and the brand. Uh, going down to the bottom right, um, uh, we've got uh, the Clyde, which is in uh, Port Moody. And this is with a uh, partner Port and I think this is pretty close to being 100% pre-sold and uh, starting, I think they've started construction now. In the middle is Dooney Trunk Road. So this is an apartment building that we built in Port Moody with PC Urban and we had it pre-sold to an institutional group. That is now completed and it's closing, I think this week, maybe yesterday. So that's a great outcome and it's ahead of schedule and ahead of budget. And then the last one on the, on the bottom left is Langley Gateway. And this is with density. Um, this is very close. Well, this is now 100% pre-sold and just starting construction. So we like that small bay industrial product. Thanks, Mark. Helpful to hear how the team is navigating in that fund with respect to uh, challenges that get thrown the way, and then you know, useful to see those those wins despite some of the curveballs we receive. Uh, can you? maybe at a high level reflect on what we learned in 2020. And is there anything else that you haven't already mentioned that we're doing to bulletproof our portfolios for the future? Certainly. Um, so um, rent collection, as I've said in the previous webinars, that's all our clients wanted to hear when the pandemic started. And we fielded a lot of phone calls, like how's our portfolio standing up? So if the income was not compromised, then the assets in the portfolio would continue to perform. And unfortunately, that's exactly what happened. So we were very lucky. And it's, it's partly due to how we built the portfolio. Um, so in terms of geography, it's really not just the city, Ethan. It's, it's the node or the location within that city that matters to ensure that there's always going to be strong user demand. So I, the, the other important consideration is the asset type. Um, we learned a lot during COVID on what assets are resilient and during a pandemic, um, what we learned is that, and again, I, I've said this before, multifamily rental apartment buildings, self-storage and industrial and certain types of office, they all performed extremely well. So we're not sure what that next event might look like, but we, we will always you know, continue to be conservative. You know, we're, we're gonna build a well-diversified portfolio um, that we're not, where any asset is not too large and, it, and if it failed or struggled, it's not gonna move the dial in the wrong direction. So this, this will ensure that our portfolios are built in a way that helps guard against that next event, whatever that event might be and whenever it comes. Another um, point of interest um, is that we have a pretty rigorous approval process 
We have an investment committee made up of four real estate experts. Um, their role is to challenge us on our assumptions and make our Nicole Wealth real estate team accountable. So every single acquisition, um, it's fully vetted and approved by that investment committee. Um, the process ensures appropriate accountability and governance. It's great to hear you walk through all of those different methods of risk reduction to prepare for an uncertain future. Um, in, in early 2021, Nicola Wealth acquired Blackwood Partners in Toronto. Can you explain why we formed this strategic partnership and how it fits into the long term? Yes, yeah, so um, we acquired them in January of 2021, and that's uh, that. But the Blackwood team is led by uh, John Hayes and and Mike Michael Cairns and Jonathan Button, and they're headquartered in Toronto. Um, they have a long track record of real estate performance in many major markets such as Toronto, Vancouver, Victoria, and others. Their clientele is predominantly institutional and pension funds, but they also have other private and corporate clients that. Um, and they're, and they're stable. So Blackwood is, is really a great complement to our Nicola Wealth real estate team and that they have a, an established track record um, and relationships with the institutional world. Um, this, that acquisition um, reinforced our assumptions that these institutional clients, uh, they, they favored the Blackwood acquisition uh, by Nicola Wealth particularly on the projects where we partner with them and we put skin in the game. That was a really important um, consideration when we interviewed their clients uh, before we did the acquisition. So already we've now um, partnered with um, Blackwood on two major industrial deals in the Ontario market. And uh, we're optimistic on the future pipeline working with that team. So we're off to a great start and we're optimistic on the future. And I think we got two pro the, the two projects we're going to put on the screen here, I'll just touch on. The first one on the left is uh, it's it's just north of Vaughan. It's at King and Jane, and this is a partnership with two other major pension funds and us, and we're building um, four buildings uh, in phases that will total uh, 100 1.7 million square feet of industrial space. And for those who don't know, the industrial market, the vacancy rate in Toronto is almost zero, so there's high demand for industrial users. And then the one on the right is um, is Kelson Avenue, and this is in Hamilton, and this is right on the QEW. And this is uh, we're going to be building in two phases, a million square feet of industrial space, and we'll be we just closed on that recently, and we'll be getting the our our plans approved and starting that into production as well very soon. That's great to see those examples again. Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that we added recently an in-house mortgage specialist to the team. How is this important and, and why was that decision made? Sure, um, given the size of our three real estate funds now exceeding 5 billion in gross asset value, I mean, there's obvious benefits to having an in-house mortgage team. Um, Nicola Wealth uses debt responsibly to help um, produce attractive leverage returns for our clients. But you can imagine with over 220 properties, there's a high volume of uh, procurement for land loans, construction loans, acquisition loans, and renewals. It's overwhelming. So it's not only just the procurement process, but it's also the paperwork, the, the, you know, the covenants, the insurance. I mean, all, all of these things are all related to this activity and you need a, you need a team to, to coordinate this. So given our profile now, um, given our size, uh, our track record and our covenant, uh, this has made Nicola Wealth Real Estate um, very well known to the lending community. We're now, we're, we're viewed as a very desirable borrower and that helps us negotiate very attractive terms. So adding these specialists to our Nicola Wealth Real Estate team, it was essential to, to deal with a high volume of mortgages and it helps achieve great outcomes. Thanks, Mark. One of the buzz terms out there ESG, which refers to the consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors, it's gaining traction and the requirement to have a clearer policy is growing. Can you speak to uh, you know, our policy in this regard? ESG, yes, one of my favorite topics. Um, so for everybody's benefit, ESG stands for environmental, social governance. 
And so for large companies like Nicola Wealth, this is not an option. It's mandatory that we have a policy at all levels. Um, and this trickles down to our three Nicola Wealth real estate funds. Um, we do have a formal ESG policy right now for our real estate. However, we are in the process of refining it to be more robust uh, in keeping with ever-changing standards and measurements. So this, is, this will include all our existing properties as well as any new acquisitions, including our build-to-own projects. So let, let me just give you a couple examples of what we're doing. Um, so the first example is uh, 25 Watt Line, which is a, it's an office building in Toronto. Um, and when we acquired this asset, we did an energy audit to identify some of the um, energy reducing initiatives that we could do. So here's what we actually completed. Um, we did LED lighting throughout. We did water flow monitoring. We did high efficiency in, in the air units. The results were fantastic. So the measurement is we are saving enough electricity to power 21 homes for a year. The gas savings is equivalent to five passenger vehicles and water consumption is reduced by the amount equal to three and a half Olympic swimming size pools. So this is impactful. Another cool and kind of fun project is that um, we're doing this in several of our buildings um, is the installation of beehives. I know this might sound weird, but um, not only are they good for the environment, but the beehives also provide us with an opportunity to interact with our tenants on a social level and they love this. So we host seminars to teach about the, the bees, not the birds and the bees, but the bees. And then, <laughs> and, and then we sell the honey and with the proceeds um, going to charities uh, selected by the tenants. So it's a, it's a great way to interact with our tenants. That's great. And, you know, on a related matter, we've got uh, climate change. It's in the news every day. It's, it feels like a more imminent and serious concern as each year passes. How is this impacting our strategy and our decision-making process? And, you know, with regards to acquisitions as well as the existing portfolio of assets? Yeah, this is obviously a very serious topic. Um, and it's, it's unfolding by the day. We see it not just locally here, but ac across the world. Um, we do receive inquiries, uh, Ethan, from our clients from time to time asking these questions. Anytime there's a, a major uh, climate event, you know, these questions come in to the advisors and they want to know how this is impacting our existing assets, but they also want to know how it's impacting our decision making and our acquisition process and criteria. There's not an easy answer um, because each geographic community is impacted by climate in unique ways. So for example, um, like clockwork in the South and Southeast US, every August and September, major storms come in. They, we don't know what path that storm is going to take in the US, uh, but it could affect several states um, depending on the path. Um, forest fires like clockwork are now hitting the West Coast. So we're going through it right now in BC and it's gonna, it's hitting the West Coast of the US and you know Washington State and uh, Oregon and for sure California. Uh, flooding, it's occurring around the world in certain areas in, in, um, in North America. Um, water shortages, you know, will that affect real estate in certain uh, states in the, in, the, in the Southwest? So you can't prevent against every event, but you gotta be aware um, of the potential impact to our asset um, and on its location. And that's why insurance is such an important topic and will continue to play a large role in the types of assets and markets that we invest in. Thanks for that, Mark. In the interest of time, I think we're going to switch to our question and answer period. We've got a number of questions coming in. If, so it's okay, we're gonna work through as many as we can in the five minutes that we've got left here. Okay. Um, can you comment on the outlook for enclosed shopping malls? You talked about it, and on the one hand, real killers were hit, but on the other hand, you see centers like uh, Metrotown being transformed into mixed use. Uh, can you comment about that? Sure. Um, so other than hotels and closed malls, they suffered the most in 2020 during COVID. Many tenants, they couldn't meet the rental obligations. Um, and as a result, uh, many malls were closed or had limited capacity and property value property valuations as, as a result declined. Um, however, we can already, we can already see a bounce back um, 
with these malls as they're now starting to function, you know, near full capacity, which coincides with the vaccine rollout. Um, so with the cap rate compression experience and other prime assets that I've talked about today, such as apartment buildings and self-storage and industrial, retail is starting to look pretty interesting. And that's why we're seeing a spike in the demand. Um, so as it relates to the regional malls in particular, like you've raised Metrotown or say Oak Ridge Center to pick a couple examples out west, um, they're developing into small villages or cities because what they're doing is they're complementing the retail with other uses such as office space, rental apartments, residential condo, medical office space, uh, maybe even self-storage. So they're really trying to redefine themselves. So I, the answer is yes. Shopping malls at, such as Metrotown and Oak Ridge, they will fall under a broader new category. They're not just a mall. Thanks, Mark. The next question. In the same way there were examples of distressed real estate listings after the Great Recession, are you seeing any distressed opportunities post-COVID? I wish uh, probably earlier in COVID, but not now. Uh, a lot of people are on the sidelines until they were comfortable jumping back in. So I think, you, I think if you made that move back in, if you were bold and made the move in the summer of 2020, you probably could have. But as uh, people got more comfortable in the fall of last year, like, like us, uh, a lot of capital rolled back in. So it's a really crowded playing field with a lot of capital out there looking for value. So retail, as an example, is now in high demand due to the higher cap rate and the low interest rates, which really provides an attractive spread for buyers. So that is, that is an area that uh, I think a lot of people are starting to focus on because they're, they're, they're looking at the other asset types that are popular, like the ones I mentioned, and those are expensive. Those are, those are hard to buy. So the market is so picked over and it's really hard to find value on listed properties that are marketed by brokers underwritten to perfection and they're doing their job well. So where we seem to find value is finding those deals on an off market basis or a quiet basis. That's where we do our best work. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next question. Are there any new geographic markets you are considering in Canada or the U S uh, well, in Canada right now, um, well, the markets we're in right now are Victoria, Vancouver, a little bit in Edmonton, uh, a little bit in Calgary. We have, we like Winnipeg and we're going to acquire more. Toronto, we have a big position, but the two markets we're really focused on right now are Ottawa and Montreal, probably more in the industrial type category. We might look at the Maritimes, but um, that's a long way to fly. So <laughs> I think I'll stick with Ottawa and Montreal. And then for the US, um, we're in the process of doing a pretty significant acquisition in Minneapolis, buying a large industrial portfolio. So that's a market that we're, we're just uh, about to close on now. And we're very excited about that acquisition. Um, so that'll complement the current markets we'd like to invest in, such as Seattle, Las Vegas, um, Denver, and Phoenix. Um, but a couple other markets that we're really looking at closely right now that we expect to be making a, a, uh, some acquisitions on very soon are Austin and Dallas. We like those markets. They're, they're growing, they're tax friendly. And so these are for the commercial assets, mostly industrial. Of course, we have Ventera, our value partner, who uh, we have 70 odd buildings in our multifamily uh, portfolio that sits within the U.S. fund, and that does well. We we value that partnership with uh, with Ventera, and they continue to uh, to acquire more assets in the south and southeast markets. Thanks, Mark. I think we've got time for one more question. What is your take on how real estate in Alberta will perform in the short to medium term? So we put the pause button on Alberta. Um, a lot of clients, when they see the headlines on the negative uh, economy there, uh, you know, the last couple of years, you know, they phone in and say, what's our allocation? They want to know. And so we have been working down our allocation in, in that market, either by selling the odd asset or just quite frankly, our portfolio is growing elsewhere. So it naturally reduces our exposure to Alberta. But what's interesting right now is there's a lot of people looking closely at Calgary and Edmonton. So they're coming back because they see value. So I wouldn't write it off. We want it to succeed, but we're going to just go carefully in that marketplace. We're watching. There's certain asset types. Obviously, we're not buying office in downtown Calgary. That's going to be a while. But, you know, there is going to be opportunities probably on the industrial side, I think, in uh, both the Calgary and Edmonton market. So I think it's something that we're going to continue to watch closely, but I wouldn't write those cities off. 
Thanks, Mark. We really appreciate you presenting today. Informative as always. Thank you. To our, to our attendees, thank you for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed the discussion. It will be made available for replay to you afterwards. And please be on the lookout as we'll have another webinar uh, for early October. And so you can be on the lookout for more information and an invitation next month in September. Thanks again and bye for now.